Part ten of Prose Romances from the Oxford and Cambridge Magazine by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hollow Land, Chapter Two, Failing in the World. Now at that time we drove cattle in Red Harold's land, and we took no hoof but from the lords and rich men, but of these we had a mighty drove, both oxen and sheep and horses and besides even hawks and hounds and a huntsman or two to take care of them and about noon we drew away from the cornlands that lay beyond the pastures and mingled with them and reached a wide moor which was called goliah's land i scarce know why except that it belonged neither to red harold or us but was debatable and the cattle began to go slowly and our horses were tired and the sun struck down very hot upon us for there was no shadow and the day was cloudless all about the edge of the moor except on the side from which we had come was a rim of hills not very high but very rocky and steep otherwise the moor itself was flat and through these hills was one pass guarded by our men which pass led to the hill castle of the lilies it was not wonderful that of this moor many wild stories were told being such a strange lonely place some of them one knew alas to be over true in the old time before we went to the good town this moor had been the mustering place of our people and our house had done deeds enough of blood and horror to turn our white lilies red and our blue cross to a fiery one but some of those wild tales i never believed they had to do mostly with men losing their way without any apparent cause for there were plenty of landmarks finding some well-known spot and then just beyond it a place they had never even dreamed of florian florian said arnold for god's sake stop as every one else is stopping to look at the hills yonder i always thought there was a curse upon us what does god mean by shutting us up here look at the cattle oh christ they have found it out too see some of them are turning to run back again towards harold's land oh unhappy unhappy from that day forward he leaned forward rested his head on his horse's neck and wept like a child i felt so irritated with him that i could almost have slain him then and there was he mad had these wild doings of ours turned his strong wise head are you my brother arnold that i used to think such a grand man when i was a boy i said or are you changed too like everybody and everything else what do you mean look look he said grinding his teeth in agony i raised my eyes where was the one pass between the rim of stern rocks nothing the enemy behind us that grim wall in front what wonder that each man looked in his fellow's face for help and found it not yet i refused to believe that there was any truth either in the wild stories that i had heard when i was a boy or in this story told me so clearly by my eyes now i called out cheerily hugh come here he came what do you think of this some mere dodge on harold's part are we cut off think sir florian god forgive me for ever thinking at all i have given up that long and long ago because thirty years ago i thought this that the house of lilies would deserve anything in the way of bad fortune that god would send them so i gave up thinking and took to fighting but if you think that harold had anything to do with this why in god's name i wish i could think so i felt a dull weight on my heart had our house been the devil's servants all along i thought we were god's servants the day was very still but what little wind there was was at our backs i watched hugh's face not being able to answer him he was the cleverest man at war that i have known either before or since that day sharper than any hound in ear and scent clearer sighted than any eagle he was listening now intently i saw a slight smile cross his face heard him mutter yes i think so verily that is better a great deal better then he stood up in his stirrups and shouted hurrah for the lilies mary rings mary rings i shouted 
though I did not know the reason for his exultation. My brother lifted his head and smiled too grimly. Then, as I listened, I heard clearly the sound of a trumpet, an enemy's trumpet too. After all, it was only mist or some such thing, I said, for the pass between the hills was clear enough now. Hurrah! Only mist, said Arnold, quite elated. Merry rings! And we all began to think of fighting, for after all, what joy is equal to that? There were five hundred of us, two hundred spears, the rest archers, and both archers and men-at-arms were picked men. "'How many of them are we to expect?' said I. "'Not under a thousand, certainly, probably more, Sir Florian. My brother Arnold, by the way, had knighted me before we left the good town, and Hugh liked to give me the handle to my name. How was it, by the way, that no one had ever made him a knight?' "'Let every one look to his arms and horse, and come away from those silly cows, sons,' shouted Arnold. Hugh said, "'They will be here in an hour, fair sir.' So we got clear of the cattle, and dismounted, and both ourselves took food and drink, and our horses. Afterwards we tightened our saddle-girths, shook our great pots of helmets on, except Arnold, whose rusty red hair had been his only headpiece in battle for years and years, and stood with our spears close by our horses, leaving room for the archers to retreat between our ranks. And they got their arrows ready, and planted their stakes before a little peat moss, and there we waited, and saw their pennons at last floating high above the corn of the fertile land, then heard their many horse-hoofs ring upon the hard-parched moor, and the archers began to shoot. It had been a strange battle. We had never fought better, and yet with all it had ended in a retreat. Indeed, all along every man but Arnold and myself, even Hugh, had been trying at least to get the enemy between him and the way toward the pass, and now we were all drifting that way, the enemy trying to cut us off, but never able to stop us because he could only throw small bodies of men in our way, whom we scattered and put to flight in their turn. I never cared less for my life than then. Indeed, in spite of all my boasting and hardness of belief, I should have been happy to have died. Such a strange weight of apprehension was on me, and yet I got no scratch even. I had soon put off my great helm, and was fighting in my mail coif only, and here I swear that three knights together charged me, aiming at my bare face, yet never touched me. For as for one, I put his lance aside with my sword, and the other two in some most wonderful manner got their spears locked in each other's armour, and so had to submit to be knocked off their horses. And we still neared the pass, and began to see distinctly the ferns that grew on the rocks, and the fair country between the rift in them, spreading out there blue-shadowed whereupon came a great rush of men of both sides striking side-blows at each other spitting cursing and shrieking as they tore away like a herd of wild hogs so being careless of life as i said i drew rein and turning my horse waited quietly for them and i knotted the reins and laid them on the horse's neck and stroked him that he whinnied then got both my hands to my sword. Then, as they came on, I noted hurriedly that the first man was one of Harold's men, and one of our men behind him leaned forward to prod him with his spear, but could not reach so far, till he himself was run through the eye with a spear, and throwing his arms up, fell dead with a shriek. And I noted concerning this first man that the laces of his helmet were loose, and when he saw me, he lifted his left hand to his head, took off his helm and cast it at me, and still tore on. The helmet flew over my head, and I, sitting still there, swung out, hitting him on the neck. His head flew right off, for the mail no more held than a piece of silk. Mary rings! And my horse whinnied again, and we both of us went at it, and fairly stopped that rout, so that there was a knot of quite close and desperate fighting wherein we had the best of that fight and slew most of them albeit my horse was slain and my mail coif cut through 
then i bade a squire fetch me another horse and began meanwhile to upbraid those knights for running in such a strange disorderly race instead of standing and fighting cleverly moreover we had drifted even in this successful fight still nearer to the pass so that the conies who dwelt there were beginning to consider whether they should not run into their holes but one of the knights said be not angry with me sir florian but do you think you will go to heaven the saints i hope so i said but one who had stood near him whispered to him to hold his peace so i cried out o oh, friend i hold this world and all therein so cheap now that i see not anything in it but shame which can any longer anger me wherefore speak out then sir florian men say that at your christening some fiend took on him the likeness of a priest and strove to baptize you in the devil's name but god had mercy on you so that the fiend could not choose but baptize you in the name of the most holy trinity and yet men say that you hardly believe any doctrine such as other men do and will at the end only go to heaven round about as it were not at all by the intercession of our lady they say too that you can see no ghosts or other wonders whatever happens to other christian men i smiled well friend i scarcely call this a disadvantage moreover what has it to do with the matter in hand how was this in heaven's name we had been quite still resting while this talk was going on but we could hear the hawks chattering from the rocks we were so close now and my heart sunk within me there was no reason why this should not be true there was no reason why anything should not be true this sir florian said the knight again how would you feel inclined to fight if you thought that everything about you was mere glamour this earth here the rocks the sun the sky i do not know where i am for certain i do not know that it is not midnight instead of undern i do not know if i have been fighting men or only simulacra but i think we all think that we have been led into some devil's trap or other and and may god forgive me my sins i wish i had never been born there now he was weeping they all wept how strange it was to see all those rough bearded men blubbering there and snivelling till the tears ran over their armour and mingled with the blood so that it dropped down to the earth in a dim dull red rain my eyes indeed were dry but then so was my heart i felt far worse than weeping came to but nevertheless i spoke cheerily dear friends where are your old men's hearts gone to now see now this is a punishment for our sins is it well for our forefathers sins or our own if the first o oh brothers be very sure that if we bear it manfully god will have something very good in store for us hereafter but if for our sins is it not certain that he cares for us yet for note that he suffers the wicked to go their own ways pretty much moreover brave men brothers ought to be the masters of simulacra come is it so hard to die once and for all still no answer came from them they sighed heavily only i heard the sound of more than one or two swords as they rattled back to their scabbards nay one knight stripping himself of surcoat and hauberk and drawing his dagger looked at me with a grim smile and said sir florian do so then he drew the dagger across his throat and he fell back dead they shuddered those brave men and crossed themselves and i had no heart to say a word more but mounted the horse which had been brought to me and rode away slowly for a few yards then i became aware that there was a great silence over the whole field so i lifted my eyes and looked and behold no man struck at another then from out of a band of horsemen came harold and he was covered all over with a great scarlet cloth as before put on over the head and flowing all about his horse but rent with the fight he put off his helm and drew back his mail coif then took a trumpet from the hand of a herald and blew strongly and in the midst of his blast i heard a voice call out o florian come and speak to me for the last time so when i turned i beheld arnold standing by himself but near him stood hugh and ten others with drawn swords then i wept and so went to him weeping and he said 
thou seest brother that we must die and i think by some horrible and unheard of death and the house of the lilies is just dying too and now i repent me of swanhilda's death now i know that it was a poor cowardly piece of revenge instead of a brave act of justice thus has god shown us the right o oh, florian curse me so will it be straighter truly thy mother when she bore thee did not think of this rather saw thee in the tourney at this time in her fond hopes glittering with gold and doing nightly or else mingling thy brown locks with the golden hair of some maiden weeping for the love of thee god forgive me god forgive me what harm brother i said this is only failing in the world what if we had not failed in a little while it would have made no difference truly just now i felt very miserable but now it has passed away and i am happy o oh, brave heart he said yet shall we part just now florian farewell the road is long i said farewell then we kissed each other and hugh and the others wept now all this time the trumpets had been ringing ringing great doleful peals then they ceased and above all sounded red harold's voice so i looked round towards that pass and when i looked i no longer doubted any of those wild tales of glamour concerning goliah's land for though the rocks were the same and though the conies still stood gazing at the doors of their dwellings though the hawks still cried out shrilly though the fern still shook in the wind yet beyond oh such a land not to be described by any because of its great beauty lying a great hollow land the rocks going down on this side in precipices then reaches and reaches of loveliest country trees and flowers and corn then the hills green and blue and purple till their ledges reached the white snowy mountains at last then with all manner of strange feelings my heart in the midst of my body was even like melting wax o oh, you house of the lily you are conquered yet i will take vengeance only on a few therefore let all those who wish to live come and pile their swords and shields and helms behind me in three great heaps and swear fealty afterwards to me yes all but the false knights arnold and florian we were holding each other's hands and gazing and we saw all our knights yea all but squire hugh and his ten heroes pass over the field singly or in groups of three or four with their heads hanging down in shame and they cast down their notched swords and dinted lilied shields and brave crested helms into three great heaps behind red harold then stood behind no man speaking to his fellow or touching him then dolefully the great trumpet sang over the dying house of the lily and red harold led his men forward but slowly on they came spear and mail glittering in the sunlight and i turned and looked at that good land and a shuddering delight seized my soul but i felt my brother's hand leave mine and saw him turn his horse's head and ride swiftly towards the pass that was a strange pass now and at the edge he stopped turned round and called out aloud i pray thee harold forgive me now farewell all then the horse gave one bound forward and we heard the poor creature's scream when he felt that he must die and we heard afterwards for we were near enough for that even a clang and a crash so i turned about me to hugh and he understood me though i could not speak we shouted all together mary rings then laid our bridles on the necks of our horses spurred forward and in five minutes they were all slain and i was down among the horse hoofs not slain though not wounded red harold smiled grimly when he saw me rise and lash out again he and some ten others dismounted and holding their long spears out i went back 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 i saw what it meant and sheathed my sword and their laughter rolled all about and i too smiled 
presently they all stopped and i fell to the last foot of turf giving under my feet i looked down and saw the crack there widening then in a moment i fell and a cloud of dust and earth rolled after me then again their mirth rose into thunder peals of laughter but through it all i heard red harold shout silence evil dogs for as i fell i stretched out my arms and caught a tuft of yellow broom some three feet from the brow and hung there by the hands my feet being loose in the air then red harold came and stood on the precipice above me his great axe over his shoulder and he looked down on me not ferociously or most kindly while the wind from the hollow land blew about his red raiment tattered and dusty now and i felt happy though it pained me to hold straining by the broom yet i said i will hold out to the last it was not long the plant itself gave way and i fell and as i fell i fainted end of part ten part eleven of prose romances from the oxford and cambridge magazine by william morris this librivox recording is in the public domain the hollow land chapter three leaving the world fit the first i had thought when i fell that i should never wake again but i woke at last for a long time i was quite dizzied and could see nothing at all horrible doubts came creeping over me i half expected to see presently great half-formed shapes come rolling up to me to crush me something fiery not strange too utterly horrible to be strange but utterly vile and ugly the sight of which would have killed me when i was upon the earth came rolling up to torment me in fact i doubted if i were in hell i knew i deserved to be but i prayed and then it came into my mind that i could not pray if i were in hell also there seemed to be a cool green light all about me which was sweet then presently i heard a glorious voice ring out clear close to me christ keep the hollow land through the sweet springtide when the apple blossoms bless the lowly bent hillside thereat my eyes were slowly unsealed and i saw the blessedest sight i have ever seen before or since for i saw my love she sat about five yards from me on a great grey stone that had much moss on it one of the many scattered along the side of the stream by which i lay she was clad in loose white raiment close to her hands and throat her feet were bare her hair hung loose a long way down but some of it lay on her knees i said white raiment but long spikes of light scarlet went down from the throat lost here and there in the shadows of the folds and growing smaller and smaller died before they reached her feet i was lying with my head resting on soft moss that some one had gathered and placed under me she when she saw me moving and awake came and stood over me with a gracious smile she was so lovely and tender to look at and so kind yet with all no one man or woman had ever frightened me half so much she was not fair in white and red like many beautiful women are being rather pale but like ivory for smoothness and her hair was quite golden not light yellow but dusky golden i tried to get up on my feet but was too weak and sunk back again she said no not just yet do not trouble yourself or try to remember anything just at present therewithal she kneeled down and hung over me closer to-morrow you may perhaps have something hard to do or bear i know but now you must be as happy as you can be quietly happy why did you start and turn pale when i came to you do you not know who i am nay but you do i see and i have been waiting here so long for you so you must have expected to see me you cannot be frightened of me are you but i could not answer a word but all the time strange knowledge strange feelings were filling my brain and my heart she said you are tired 
rest and dream happily so she sat by me and sung to lull me to sleep while i turned on my elbow and watched the waving of her throat and the singing of all the poets i had ever heard and of many others too not born till years long after i was dead floated all about me as she sung and i did indeed dream happily when i awoke it was the time of the cold dawn and the colours were gathering themselves together whereat in fatherly approving fashion the sun sent all across the east long bars of scarlet and orange that after faded through yellow to green and blue and she sat by me still i think she had been sitting there and singing all the time all through hot yesterday for i had been sleeping day long and night long all through the falling evening under moonlight and starlight the night through and now it was dawn and i think too that neither of us had moved at all for the last thing i remembered before i went to sleep was the tips of her fingers brushing my cheek as she knelt over me with down drooping arm and still now i felt them there moreover she was just finishing some fainting measure that died before it had time to get painful in its passion dear lord how i loved her yet did i not dare to touch her or even speak to her she smiled with delight when she saw i was awake again and slid down her hand on to mine but some shuddering dread made me draw it away again hurriedly then i saw the smile leave her face what would i not have given for courage to hold her body quite tight to mine but i was so weak she said have you been very happy yea i said it was the first word i had spoken there and my voice sounded strange ah she said you will talk more when you get used to the air of the hollow land have you been thinking of your past life at all if not try to think of it what thing in heaven or earth do you wish for most still i said no word but she said in a wearied way well now i think you will be strong enough to get to your feet and walk take my hand and try therewith she held it out i strove hard to be brave enough to take it but could not i only turned away shuddering sick and grieved to the heart's core of me then struggling hard with hand and knee and elbow i scarce rose and stood up totteringly while she watched me sadly still holding out her hand but as i rose in my swinging to and fro the steel sheath of my sword struck her on the hand so that the blood flowed from it which she stood looking at for a while then dropped it downwards and turned to look at me for i was going then as i walked she followed me so i stopped and turned and said almost fiercely i am going alone to look for my brother the vehemence with which i spoke or something else burst some blood vessel within my throat and we both stood there with the blood running from us on to the grass and summer flowers she said if you find him wait with him till i come yea and i turned and left her following the course of the stream upwards and as i went i heard her low singing that almost broke my heart for its sadness and i went painfully because of my weakness and because also of the great stones and sometimes i went along a spot of earth where the river had been used to flow in flood time and which was now bare of everything but stones and the sun now risen high poured down on everything a great flood of fierce light and scorching heat and burnt me sorely so that i almost fainted but about noontide i entered a wood close by the stream a beech wood intending to rest myself the herbage was thin and scattered there sprouting up from amid the leaf sheaths and nuts of the beeches which had fallen year after year on that same spot the outside boughs swept low down the air itself seemed green when you entered within the shadow of the branches they overroofed the place so with tender green only here and there showing spots of blue but what lay at the foot of a great beech tree but some dead knight in armour only the helmet off a wolf was prowling round it who ran away snarling when he saw me coming so i went up to that dead knight and fell on my knees before him laying my head on his breast for it was arnold 
he was quite cold but had not been dead for very long i would not believe him dead but went down to the stream and brought him water tried to make him drink what would you he was as dead as swanhilda neither came there any answer to my cries that afternoon but the moaning of the wood doves in the beeches so then i sat down and took his head on my knees and closed the eyes and wept quietly while the sun sunk lower but a little after sunset i heard a rustle through the leaves that was not the wind and looking up my eyes met the pitying eyes of that maiden something stirred rebelliously within me i ceased weeping and said it is unjust unfair what right has swanhilda to live did not god give her up to us how much better was he than ten swanhildas and look you see he is dead now this i shrieked out being mad and though i trembled when i saw some stormy wrath that vexed her very heart and loving lips gathering on her face i yet sat there looking at her and screaming screaming till all the place rang but when growing hoarse and breathless i ceased she said with straightened brow and scornful mouth so bravely done must i then though i am a woman call you a liar for saying god is unjust you to punish her had not god then punished her already how many times when she woke in the dead night do you suppose she missed seeing king urain's pale face and hacked head lying on the pillow by her side whether by night or day what things but screams did she hear when the wind blew loud round about the palace corners and did not that face too often come before her pale and bleeding as it was long ago and gaze at her from unhappy eyes poor eyes with changed purpose in them no more hope of converting the world when that blow was once struck truly it was very wicked no more dreams but only fierce struggles with the devil for very life no more dreams but failure at last and death happier so in the hollow land she grew so pitying as she gazed at his dead face that i began to weep again unreasonably while she saw not that i was weeping but looked only on arnold's face but after turned on me frowning unjust yes truly unjust enough to take away life and all hope from her you have done a base cowardly act you and your brother here disguise it as you may you deserve all god's judgments you but i turned my eyes and wet face to her and said do not curse me there do not look like swanhilda for see now you said at first that you had been waiting long for me give me your hand now for i love you so then she came and knelt by where i sat and i caught her in my arms and she prayed to be forgiven oh florian i have indeed waited long for you and when i saw you my heart was filled with joy but you would neither touch me nor speak to me so that i became almost mad forgive me we will be so happy now oh do you know this is what i have been waiting for all these years it made me glad i know when i was a little baby in my mother's arms to think i was born for this and afterwards as i grew up i used to watch every breath of wind through the beech boughs every turn of the silver poplar leaves thinking it might be you or some news of you then i rose and drew her up with me but she knelt again by my brother's side and kissed him and said oh brother the hollow land is only second best of the places god has made for heaven also is the work of his hand afterwards we dug a deep grave among the beech roots and there we buried arnold de lilis and i have never seen him since scarcely even in dreams surely god has had mercy on him for he was very leal and true and brave he loved many men and was kind and gentle to his friends neither did he hate any but swanhilda but as for us two margaret and me i cannot tell you concerning our happiness such things cannot be told only this i know that we abode continually in the hollow land until i lost it moreover this i can tell you margaret was walking with me as she often walked near the place where i had first seen her presently we came upon a woman sitting dressed in scarlet and gold raiment 
with her head laid down upon her knees likewise we heard her sobbing margaret who is she i said i knew not that any dwelt in the hollow land but us two only she said i know not who she is only sometimes these many years i have seen her scarlet robe flaming from far away amid the quiet green grass but i was never so near her as this florian i am afraid let us come away fit the second such a horrible grey november day it was the fog smell all about the fog creeping into our very bones and i sat there trying to recollect at any rate something under those fir trees that i ought to have known so well just think now i had lost my best years somewhere for i was past the prime of life my hair and beard were scattered with white my body was growing weaker my memory of all things was very faint my raiment purple and scarlet and blue once was so stained that you could scarce call it any colour was so tattered that it scarce covered my body though it seemed once to have fallen in heavy folds to my feet and still when i rose to walk though the miserable november mist lay in great drops upon my bare breast yet was i obliged to wind my raiment over my arm it draggled so wretched slimy textureless thing in the brown mud on my head was a light morion which pressed on my brow and pained me so i put my hand up to take it off but when i touched it i stood still in my walk shuddering i nearly fell to the earth with shame and sick horror for i laid my hand on a lump of slimy earth with worms coiled up in it i could scarce forbear from shrieking but breathing such a prayer as i could think of i raised my hand again and seized it firmly worse horror still the rust had eaten it into holes and i gripped my own hair as well as the rotting steel the sharp edge of which cut into my fingers but setting my teeth gave a great wrench for i knew that if i let go of it then no power on the earth or under it could make me touch it again god be praised i tore it off and cast it far from me i saw the earth and the worms and the green weeds and sun-begotten slime whirling out from it radiatingly as it spun round about i was girt with a sword too the leathern belt of which had shrunk and squeezed my waist dead leaves had gathered in knots about the buckles of it the gilded handle was encrusted with clay in many parts the velvet sheath miserably worn but verily when i took hold of the hilt and dreaded lest instead of a sword i should find a serpent in my hand lo then i drew out my own true blade and shook it flawless from hilt to point gleaming white in that mist therefore it sent a thrill of joy to my heart to know that there was one friend left me yet i sheathed it again carefully and undoing it from my waist hung it about my neck then catching up my rags in my arms i drew them up till my legs and feet were altogether clear from them afterwards folded my arms over my breast gave a long leap and ran looking downward but not giving heed to my way once or twice i fell over stumps of trees and such like for it was a cut down wood that i was in but i rose always though bleeding and confused and went on still sometimes tearing madly through briars and gorse bushes so that my blood dropped on the dead leaves as i went i ran in this way for about an hour then i heard a gurgling and splashing of waters i gave a great shout and leapt strongly with shut eyes and the black water closed over me when i rose again i saw near me a boat with a man in it but the shore was far off i struck out toward the boat but my clothes which i had knotted and folded about me weighed me down terribly the man looked at me and began to paddle toward me with the oar he held in his left hand having in his right a long slender spear barbed like a fish-hook perhaps i thought it is some fishing spear moreover his raiment was of scarlet with upright stripes of yellow and black all over it when my eye caught his a smile widened his mouth as if someone had made a joke but i was beginning to sink 
and indeed my head was almost under water just as he came and stood above me but before it went quite under i saw his spear gleam then felt it in my shoulder and for the present felt nothing else when i woke i was on the bank of that river the flooded waters went hurrying past me no boat on them now from the river the ground went up in gentle slopes till it grew a great hill and there on that hilltop yes i might forget many things almost everything but not that not the old castle of my father's up among the hills its towers blackened now and shattered yet still no enemy's banner waved from it so i said i would go and die there and at this thought i drew my sword which yet hung about my neck and shook it in the air till the true steel quivered then began to pace toward the castle i was quite naked no rag about me i took no heed of that only thanking god that my sword was left and so toiled up the hill i entered the castle soon by the outer court i knew the way so well that i did not lift my eyes from the ground but walked on over the lowered drawbridge through the unguarded gates and stood in the great hall at last my father's hall as bare of everything but my sword as when i came into the world fifty years before i had as little clothes as little wealth less memory and thought i verily believe than then so i lifted up my eyes and gazed no glass in the windows no hangings on the walls the vaulting yet held good throughout but seemed to be going the mortar had fallen out from between the stones and grass and fern grew in the joints the marble pavement was in some places gone and water stood about in puddles though one scarce knew how it had got there no hangings on the walls no yet strange to say instead of them the walls blazed from end to end with scarlet paintings only striped across with green damp marks in many places some falling bodily from the wall the plaster hanging down with the fading colour on it in all of them except for the shadows and the faces of the figures there was scarce any colour but scarlet and yellow here and there it seemed the painter whoever it was had tried to make his trees or his grass green but it would not do some ghastly thoughts must have filled his head for all the green went presently into yellow out sweeping through the picture dismally but the faces were painted to the very life or it seemed so there were only five of them however that were very marked or came much in the foreground and four of these i knew well though i did not then remember the names of those that had borne them they were red harold swanhilda arnold and myself the fifth i did not know it was a woman's and very beautiful then i saw that in some parts a small penthouse roof had been built over the paintings to keep them from the weather near one of these stood a man painting clothed in red with stripes of yellow and black then i knew that it was the same man who had saved me from drowning by spearing me through the shoulder so i went up to him and saw furthermore that he was girt with a heavy sword he turned round when he saw me coming and asked me fiercely what i did there i asked why he was painting in my castle thereupon with that same grim smile widening his mouth as heretofore he said i paint god's judgments and as he spoke he rattled the sword in his scabbard but i said well then you paint them very badly listen i know god's judgments much better than you do see now i will teach you god's judgments and you shall teach me painting while i spoke he still rattled his sword and when i had done shut his right eye tight screwing his nose on one side then said you have got no clothes on and may go to the devil what do you know about god's judgments well they are not all yellow and red at all events you ought to know better he screamed out oh you fool yellow and red gold and blood what do they make well i said what hell and coming close up to me he struck me with his open hand in the face 
so that the colour with which his hand was smeared was dabbed about my face the blow almost threw me down and while i staggered he rushed at me furiously with his sword perhaps it was good for me that i had got no clothes on for being utterly unencumbered i leapt this way and that and avoided his fierce eager strokes till i could collect myself somewhat while he had a heavy scarlet cloak on that trailed on the ground and which he often trod on so that he stumbled he very nearly slew me during the first few minutes for it was not strange that together with other matters i should have forgotten the art of fence but yet as i went on and sometimes bounded about the hall under the whizzing of his sword as he rested sometimes leaning on it as the point sometimes touched my bare flesh nay once as the whole sword fell flatlings on my head and made my eyes start out i remembered the old joy that i used to have and the swee swee of the sharp edge as one gazed between one's horse's ears moreover at last one fierce swift stroke just touching me below the throat tore up the skin all down my body and fell heavy on my thigh so that i drew my breath in and turned white then first as i swung my sword round my head our blades met oh to hear that chink again and i felt the notch of my sword made in his and swung out at him he guarded it and returned on me i guarded right and left and grew warm and opened my mouth to shout but knew not what to say and our sword points fell on the floor together then when we had panted a while i wiped from my face the blood that had been dashed over it shook my sword and cut at him then we spun around and round in a mad waltz to the measured music of our meeting swords and sometimes either wounded the other somewhat but not much till i beat down his sword on to his head that he fell grovelling but not cut through verily thereupon my lips opened mightily with merry rings then when he had gotten to his feet i went at him again he staggering back guarding wildly i cut at his head he put his sword up confusedly so i fitted both hands to my hilt and smote him mightily under the arm then his shriek mingled with my shout made a strange sound together he rolled over and over dead as i thought i walked about the hall in great exultation at first striking my sword point on the floor every now and then till i grew faint with loss of blood then i went to my enemy and stripped off some of his clothes to bind up my wounds withal afterwards i found in a corner bread and wine and i ate and drank thereof then i went back to him and looked and a thought struck me and i took some of his paints and brushes and kneeling down painted his face thus with stripes of yellow and red crossing each other at right angles and in each of the squares so made i put a spot of black after the manner of the painted letters in the prayer-books and romances when they are ornamented so i stood back as painters use folded my arms and admired my own handiwork yet there struck me as being something so utterly doleful in the man's white face and the blood running all about him and washing off the stains of paint from his face and hands and splashed clothes that my heart misgave me and i hoped that he was not dead i took some water from a vessel he had been using from his painting and kneeling washed his face was it some resemblance to my father's dead face which i had seen when i was young that made me pity him i laid my hand upon his heart and felt it beating feebly so i lifted him up gently and carried him towards a heap of straw that he seemed used to lie upon there i stripped him and looked to his wounds and used leechcraft the memory of which god gave me for this purpose i suppose and within seven days i found that he would not die afterwards as i wandered about the castle i came to a room in one of the upper stories that had still the roof on and windows in it with painted glass 
and there i found green raiments and swords and armour and i clothed myself so when he got well i asked him what his name was and he me and we both of us said truly i know not then said i but we must call each other some name even as men call days call me swerker he said some priest i knew once had that name and me wolf said i the wherefore i know not then he said wolf i will teach you painting now come and learn then i tried to learn painting till i thought i should die but at last learned it through very much pain and grief and as the years went on and we grew old and grey we painted purple pictures and green ones instead of the scarlet and yellow so that the walls looked altered and always we painted god's judgments and we would sit in the sunset and watch them with the golden light changing them as we yet hoped god would change both us and our works often too we would sit outside the walls and look at the trees and sky and the ways of the few men and women we saw therefrom sometimes befell adventures once there went past a great funeral of some king going to his own country not as he had hoped to go but stiff and colourless spices filling up the place of his heart and first went by very many knights with long bright hauberks on that fell down before their knees as they rode and they all had tilting helms on with the same crest so that their faces were quite hidden and this crest was two hands clasped together tightly as though they were the hands of one praying forgiveness from the one he loves best and the crest was wrought in gold moreover they had on over their hauberks surcoats which were half scarlet and half purple strewn about with golden stars also long lances that had forked knights pennons half purple and half scarlet strewn with golden stars and these went by with no sound but the fall of their horse hoofs and they went slowly so slowly that we counted them all five thousand five hundred and fifty five then went by many fair maidens whose hair was loose and yellow and who were all clad in green raiment ungirded and shod with golden shoes these also we counted being five hundred moreover some of the outermost of them viz one maiden to every twenty had long silver trumpets which they swung out to right and left blowing them and their sound was very sad then many priests and bishops and abbots who wore white albs and golden copes over them and they all sang together mournfully propter amnem babylonis and these were three hundred after that came a great knot of the lords who wore tilting helmets and sore coats emblazoned with each one his own device only each had in his hand a small staff two feet long whereon was a pennon of scarlet and purple these also were three hundred and in the midst of these was a great car hung down to the ground with purple drawn by grey horses whose trappings were half scarlet half purple and on this car lay the king whose head and hands were bare and he had on him a surcoat half purple and half scarlet strewn with golden stars and his head rested on a tilting helmet whose crest was the hands of one praying passionately for forgiveness but his own hands lay by his side as if he had just fallen asleep and all about the car were little banners half purple and half scarlet strewn with golden stars then the king who counted but as one went by also and after him came again many maidens clad in ungirt white raiment strewn with scarlet flowers and their hair was loose and yellow and their feet bare and except for the falling of their feet and the rustle of the wind through their raiment they went past quite silently these were also five hundred then lastly came many young knights with long bright hauberks falling over their knees as they rode and surcoats half scarlet and half purple strewn with golden stars 
they bore long lances with forked pennons which were half purple half scarlet strewn with golden stars their heads and their hands were bare but they bore shields each one of them which were of bright steel wrought cunningly in the midst with that bearing of the two hands of one who prays for forgiveness which was done in gold these were but five hundred then they all went by winding up and up the hill roads and when the last of them had departed out of our sight we put down our heads and wept and i said sing us one of the songs of the hollow land then he whom i had called swerker put his hand into his bosom and slowly drew out a long long tress of black hair and laid it on his knee and smoothed it weeping on it so then i left him there and went and armed myself and brought armour for him and then came back to him and threw the armour down so that it clanged and said o oh, harold let us go he did not seem surprised that i called him by the right name but rose and armed himself and then looked a good knight so we set forth and in a turn of the long road we came suddenly upon a most fair woman clothed in scarlet who sat and sobbed holding her face between her hands and her hair was very black and when harold saw her he stood and gazed at her for long through the bars of his helmet then suddenly turned and said florian i must stop here do you go on to the hollow land farewell and then i went on never turning back and him i never saw more and so i went on quite lonely but happy till i had reached the hollow land into which i let myself down most carefully by the jutting rocks and bushes and strange trailing flowers and there lay down and fell asleep fit the third and i was waked by some one singing i felt very happy i felt young again i had fair delicate raiment on my sword was gone and my armour i tried to think where i was and could not for my happiness i tried to listen to the words of the song nothing only an old echo in my ears only all manner of strange scenes from my wretched past life before my eyes in a dim far-off manner then at last slowly without effort i heard what she sang christ keep the hollow land all the summer tide still we cannot understand where the waters glide only dimly seeing them coldly slipping through many green-lipped cavern mouths where the hills are blue then she said come now and look for it love a hollow city in the hollow land i kissed margaret and we went through the golden streets under the purple shadows of the houses we went and the slow fanning backward and forward of the many-coloured banners cooled us we two alone there was no one with us no soul will ever be able to tell what we said how we looked at last we came to a fair palace cloistered off in the old time before the city grew golden from the din and hubbub of traffic those who dwelt there in the old and golden times had their own joys their own sorrows apart from the joys and sorrows of the multitude so in like manner was it now cloistered off from the eager leaning and brotherhood of the golden dwellings so now it had its own gaiety its own solemnity apart from theirs unchanged unchangeable were its marble walls whatever else changed about it we stopped before the gates and trembled and clasped each other closer for there among the marble leafage and tendrils that were round and under and over the archway that held the golden valves were wrought two figures of a man and woman winged and garlanded whose raiment flashed with stars and their faces were like faces we had seen or half seen in some dream long and long and long ago so that we trembled with awe and delight 
and i turned and seeing margaret saw that her face was that face seen or half seen long and long and long ago and in the shining of her eyes i saw that other face seen in that way and no other long and long and long ago my face and then we walked together toward the golden gates and opened them and no man gainsaid us and before us lay a great space of flowers end of the hollow land by william morris end of part 11Part 12 of Prose Romances from the Oxford and Cambridge Magazine by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Golden Wings, Oxford and Cambridge Magazine, December 1856. Leaf lethus to me, twa wordus or three, of one who was fair and free, and fell in his fight. Sir Percival i suppose my birth was somewhat after the birth of sir percival of gals for i never saw my father and my mother brought me up quaintly not like a poor man's son though indeed we had a little money and lived in a lone place it was on a bit of waste land near a river moist and without trees on the drier parts of it folks had built cottages see i can count them on my fingers six cottages of which ours was one likewise there was a little chapel with a yew-tree and graves in a churchyard graves yes a great many graves more than in the yards of many minsters i have seen because people fought a battle once near us and buried many bodies in deep pits to the east of the chapel but this was before i was born i have talked to old knights since who fought in that battle and who told me that it was all about an old lady that they fought indeed this lady who was a queen was afterwards by her own wish buried in the aforesaid chapel in a most fair tomb her image was of latin gilt and with a colour on it her hands and face were of silver and her hair gilded and most curiously wrought flowed down from her head over the marble it was a strange thing to see that gold and brass and marble inside that rough chapel which stood on the marshy common near the river now every st peter's day when the sun was at its hottest in the midsummer noontide my mother though at other times she only wore such clothes as the folk about us would dress herself most richly and shut the shutters against all the windows and light great candles and sit as though she were a queen till the evening sitting and working at a frame and singing as she worked and what she worked at was two wings wrought in gold on a blue ground and as for what she sung i could never understand it though i know now it was not in latin and she used to charge me straightly never to let any man into the house on st peter's day therefore i and our dog which was a great old bloodhound always kept the door together but one st peter's day when i was nearly twenty i sat in the house watching the door with the bloodhound and i was sleepy because of the shut-up heat and my mother's singing so i began to nod and at last though the dog often shook me by the hair to keep me awake went fast asleep and began to dream a foolish dream without hearing as men sometimes do for i thought that my mother and i were walking to mass through the snow on a christmas day but my mother carried a live goose in her hand holding it by the neck instead of her rosary and that i went along by her side not walking but turning somersaults like a mountebank my head never touching the ground when we got to the chapel door the old priest met us and said to my mother why dame alive your head is turned green ah never mind i will go and say mass but don't let little mary there go and he pointed to the goose and went then mass begun but in the middle of it the priest said out loud oh i forgot and turning round to us began to wag his grey head and white beard throwing his head right back and sinking his chin on his breast alternately 
and when we saw him do this we presently began also to knock our heads against the wall keeping time with him and with each other till the priest said peter it's dragon time now whereat the roof flew off and a great yellow dragon came down on the chapel floor with a flop and danced about clumsily wriggling his fat tail and saying to a sort of tune oh the devil the devil the devil oh the devil so i went up to him and put my hand on his breast meaning to slay him and so awoke and found myself standing up with my hand on the breast of an armed knight the door lay flat on the ground and under it lay hector our dog whining and dying for eight hours i had been asleep on awaking the blood rushed up into my face i heard my mother's low mysterious song behind me and knew not what harm might happen to her and me if that night's coming made her cease in it so i struck him with my left hand where his face was bare under his male coif and getting my sword in my right drove its point under his hauberk so that it came out behind and he fell turned over on his face and died then because my mother still went on working and singing i said no word but let him lie there and put the door up again and found hector dead i then sat down again and polished my sword with a piece of leather after i had wiped the blood from it and in an hour my mother arose from her work and raising me from where i was sitting kissed my brow saying well done lionel you have slain your greatest foe and now the people will know you for what you are before you die ah god though not before i die so i said who is he mother he seems to be some lord am i a lord then a king if the people will but know it she said then she knelt down again by the dead body turned it round again so that it lay face uppermost as before then said and so it has all come to this has it to think that you should run on my son's sword-point at last after all the wrong you have done me and mine now must i work carefully lest when you are dead you should still do me harm for that you are a king lionel yea mother come here and see this is what i have wrought these many peter's days by day and often other times by night it's a surcoat mother for me yea but take a spade and come into the wood so we went and my mother gazed about her for a while as if she were looking for something but then suddenly went forward with her eyes on the ground and she said to me it is not strange that i who know the very place i am going to take you to as well as our own garden should have a sudden fear come over me that i should not find it after all though for these nineteen years i have watched the trees change and change all about it ah here stop now we stopped before a great oak a beech tree was behind us she said dig lionel hereabouts so i dug and for an hour found nothing but beech roots while my mother seemed as if she were going mad sometimes running about muttering to herself sometimes stooping into the hole and howling sometimes throwing herself on the grass and twisting her hands together above her head she went once down the hill to a pool that had filled an old gravel pit and came back dripping with wild eyes i'm too hot she said far too hot this st peter's day clink just then from my spade against iron my mother screamed and i dug with all my might for another hour and then beheld a chest of heavy wood bound with iron ready to be heaved out of the hole now lionel weigh it out hard for your life and with some trouble i got the chest out she gave me a key i unlocked the chest and took out another wrapped in lead which also i unlocked with the silver key that my mother gave me and behold therein lay armour mail for the whole body made of very small rings wrought most wonderfully for every ring was fashioned like a serpent and though they were so small yet could you see their scales and their eyes and of some even the forked tongue was on it and lay on the rivet and the rings were gilded here and there into patterns and flowers so that the gleam of it was most glorious and the male coif was all gilded and had red and blue stones at the rivets and the tilting helm inside which the male lay when i saw it first was gilded also and had flowers pricked out on it 
and the chain of it was silver and the crest was two gold wings and there was a shield of blue set with red stones which had two gold wings for a cognizance and the hilt of the sword was gold with angels wrought in green and blue all up it and the eyes of their wings were of pearls and red stones and the sheath was of silver with green flowers on it now when i saw this armour and understood that my mother would have me put it on and ride out without fear leaving her alone i cast myself down on the grass so that i might not see its beauty for it made me mad and strove to think but what thoughts soever came to me were only of the things that would be glory in the midst of ladies battle joy among knights honour from all kings and princes and people these things but my mother wept softly above me till i arose with a great shudder of delight and drew the edges of the hauberk over my cheek i liked so to feel the rings slipping slipping till they fell off altogether then i said o oh lord god that made the world if i might only die in this armour then my mother helped me to put it on and i felt strange and new in it and yet i had neither lance nor horse so when we reached the cottage again she said see now lionel you must take this knight's horse and his lance and ride away or else the people will come here to kill another king and when you are gone you will never see me any more in life i wept thereat but she said nay but see here and taking the dead knight's lance from among the garden lilies she rent from it the pennon which had a sword on a red ground for bearing and cast it carelessly on the ground then she bound about it a pennon with my bearing gold wings on a blue ground she bid me bear the knight's body all armed as he was to put on him his helm and lay him on the floor at her bed's foot also to break his sword and cast it on our hearthstone all which things i did afterwards she put the surcoat on me and then lying down in her gorgeous raiment on her bed she spread her arms out in the form of a cross shut her eyes and said kiss me lionel for i am tired and after i had kissed her she died and i mounted my dead foe's horse and rode away neither did i ever know what wrong that was which he had done me not while i was in the body at least and do not blame me for not burying my mother i left her there because though she did not say so to me yet i knew the thoughts of her heart and that the thing she had wished so earnestly for these years and years and years had been but to lie dead with him lying dead close to her so i rode all that night for i could not stop because of the thoughts that were in me and stopping at this place and that in three days came to the city and there the king held his court with great pomp and so i went to the palace and asked to see the king whereupon they brought me into the great hall where he was with all his knights and my heart swelled within me to think that i too was a king so i prayed to him to make me a knight and he spake graciously and asked me my name so when i had told it him and said that i was a king's son he pondered not knowing what to do for i could not tell him whose son i was whereupon one of the knights came near to me and shaded his eyes with his hand as one does in a bright sun meaning to mock at me for my shining armour and he drew nearer and nearer till his long stiff beard just touched me and then i smote him on the face and he fell on the floor so the king being in a rage roared out from the door slay him but i put my shield before me and drew my sword and the women drew together aside and whispered fearfully and while some of the knights took spears and stood about me others got their armour on and as we stood thus we heard a horn blow and then an armed knight came into the hall and drew near to the king and one of the maidens behind me came and laid her hand on my shoulder so i turned and saw that she was very fair and then i was glad but she whispered to me sir squire for a love i have for your face and gold armour i will give you good counsel go presently to the king and say to him in the name of alice de rose and sir guy le bon amant i pray you three boons do this and you will be alive and a knight by to-morrow 
otherwise i think hardly the one or the other the lord reward you damoiselle i said then i saw that the king had left talking with that knight and was just going to stand up and say something out loud so i went quickly and called out with a loud voice o king gilbert of the roseland i lionel of the golden wings pray of you three boons in the name of alice de rose and sir guy le bon amont then the king gnashed his teeth because he had promised if ever his daughter alice de rose came back safe again he would on that day grant any three boons to the first man who asked them even if he were his greatest foe he said well then take them what are they first my life then that you should make me a knight and thirdly that you should take me into your service he said i will do this and moreover i forgive you freely if you will be my true man then we heard shouting arise through all the city because they were bringing the lady alice from the ships up to the palace and the people came to the windows and the houses were hung with cloths and banners of silk and gold that swung down right from the eaves to the ground likewise the bells all rang and within a while they entered the palace and the trumpets rang and men shouted so that my head whirled and they entered the hall and the king went down from the dais to meet them now a band of knights and damoiselle went before and behind and in the midst sir guy led the lady alice by the hand and he was a most stately knight strong and fair and i indeed noted the first band of knights and damoiselle well and wondered at the noble presence of the knights and was filled with joy when i beheld the maids because of their great beauty the second band i did not see for when they passed i was leaning back against the wall wishing to die with my hands before my face but when i could see she was hanging about her father's neck weeping and she never left him all that night but held his hand in feast and dance and even when i was made knight while the king with his right hand laid his sword over my shoulder she held his left hand and was close to me and the next day they held a grand tourney that i might be proven and i had never fought with knights before yet i did not doubt and alice sat under a green canopy that she might give the degree to the best knight and by her sat the good knight sir guy in a long robe for he did not mean to joust that day and indeed at first none but young knights jousted for they thought that i should not do much but i looking up to the green canopy overthrew so many of them that the elder knights began to arm and i grew most joyful as i met them and no man unhorsed me and always i broke my spear fairly or else overthrew my adversary now that maiden who counselled me in the hall told me afterwards that as i fought the lady alice held fast to the rail before her and leaned forward and was most pale never answering any word that any one might say to her till the knight guy said to her in anger alice what ails you you would have been glad enough to speak to me when king wadrains carried you off shrieking or that other time when the chain went round about you and the faggots began to smoke in the brown city do you not love me any longer oh alice alice just think a little and do not break your faith with me god hates nothing so much as this sweet try to love me even for your own sake see am i not kind to you that maiden said that she turned round to him wonderingly as if she had not caught his meaning and that just for one second then stretched out over the lists again now till about this time i had made no cry as i jousted but there came against me a very tall knight on a great horse and when we met our spears both shivered and he howled with vexation for he wished to slay me being the brother of that knight i had struck down in the hall the day before and they say that when alice heard his howl sounding faintly through the bars of his great helm she trembled but i know not for i was stronger than that knight and when we fought with swords i struck him right out of his saddle and near slew him with that stroke whereupon i shouted alice out aloud and she blushed red for pleasure and sir guy took note of it and rose up in a rage and ran down and armed 
then presently i saw a great knight come riding in with three black chevrons on a gold shield and so he began to ride at me and at first we only broke both our spears but then he drew his sword and fought quite in another way to what the other knights had so that i saw at once that i had no chance against him nevertheless for a long time he availed nothing though he wounded me here and there but at last drove his sword right through mine through my shield and my helm and i fell and lay like one dead and thereat the king cried out to cease and the degree was given to sir Guy because i had overthrown forty knights and he had overthrown me then they told me i was carried out of the lists and laid in a hostelry near the palace and Guy went up to the pavilion where alice was and she crowned him both of them being very pale for she doubted if i were slain and he knew that she did not love him thinking before that she did for he was good and true and had saved her life and honour and she poor maid wished to please her father and strove to think that all was right but i was by no means slain for the sword had only cleft my helm and when i came to myself again i felt despair of all things because i knew not that she loved me for how should she knowing nothing of me likewise dust had been cast on my gold wings and she saw it done then i heard a great crying in the street that sounded strangely in the quiet night so i sent to ask what it might be and there came presently into my chamber a man in gilded armour he was an old man and his hair and beard were grey and behind him came six men armed who carried a dead body of a young man between them and i said what is it who is he then the old man whose head was heavy for grief said oh sir this is my son for as we went yesterday with our merchandise some twenty miles from this fair town we passed by a certain hold and therefrom came a knight and men-at-arms who when my son would have fought with them overthrew him and bound him and me and all our men they said they would slay if we did aught so then they cut out my son's eyes and cut off his hands and then said the knight of high guard takes these for tribute therewithal they departed taking with them my son's eyes and his hands on a platter and when they were gone i would have followed them and slain some of them at least but my own people would not suffer me and for grief and pain my son's heart burst and he died and behold i am here then i thought i could win glory and i was much rejoiced thereat and said to the old man would you love to be revenged but he set his teeth and pulled at the skirt of his surcoat as hardly for his passion he said yes then i said i will go and try and slay this knight if you will show me the way to la haute garde and he taking my hand said o oh, glorious knight let us go now and he did not ask who i was or whether i was a good knight but began to go down the stairs at once so i put on my armour and followed him as we two set forth alone to la haute garde for no man else dared follow us and i rejoiced in thinking that while guy was sitting at the king's table feasting i was riding out to slay the king's enemies for it never once seemed possible to me that i should be worsted it was getting light again by then we came in sight of high guard we wound up the hill on foot for it was very steep i blew at the gates a great blast which was even as though the stag should blow his own mort or like the blast that balan heard for in a very short while the gates opened and a great band of armed men more than thirty i think and a knight on horseback among them who was armed in red stood before us and on one side of him was a serving man with a silver dish on the other one with a butcher's cleaver a knife and pincers so when the knight saw us he said what are you come to pay tribute in person old man and is this another fair son good sir how is your lady so i said grimly being in a rage i have a will to slay you but i could scarce say so before the old merchant rushed at the red knight with a yell who without moving slew his horse with an axe 
and then the men-at-arms speared the old man slaying him as one would an otter or a rat afterwards they were going to set on me but the red knight held them back saying nay i am enough and we spurred our horses as we met i felt just as if some one had thrown a dull brown cloth over my eyes and i felt the wretched spear point slip off his helm then i felt a great pain somewhere that did not seem to be in my body but in the world or the sky or something of that sort and i know not how long that pain seemed to last now but i think years though really i grew well and sane again in a few weeks but when i woke scarce knowing whether i was in the world or heaven or hell i heard someone singing i tried to listen but could not because i did not know where i was and was thinking of that i missed verse after verse of the song this song till at last i saw i must be in the king's palace there was a window by my bed i looked out at it and saw that i was high up down in the streets the people were going to and fro and there was a knot of folks gathered about a minstrel who sat on the edge of a fountain with his head laid sideways on his shoulder and nursing one leg on the other he was singing only having no instrument and he sang the song i had tried to listen to i heard some of it now he was fair and free at every tourney he won the degree sir guy the good knight he won alice the fair the king's own daughter with all her gold hair that shone well bright he saved a good knight who also was white and had wings bright on a blue shield and he slew the knight of the high guard in fight in red wheat that was dight in the open field i fell back on my bed and wept for i was weak with my illness to think of this truly this man was a perfect knight and deserved to win alice ah well but was this the glory i was to have and no one believed that i was a king's son and so i passed days and nights thinking of my dishonour and misery and my utter loneliness no one cared for me verily i think if any one had spoken to me lovingly i should have fallen on his neck and died while i was so weak but i grew strong at last and began to walk about and in the palace pleasance one day i met sir guy walking by himself so i told him how that i thanked him with all my heart for my life but he said it was only what a good knight ought to do for that hearing the mad enterprise i had ridden on he had followed me swiftly with a few knights and so saved me he looked stately and grand as he spoke yet i did not love him nay rather hated him though i tried hard not to do so for there was some air of pitiless triumph and coldness of heart in him that froze me so scornfully too he said that about my mad enterprise as though i must be wrong in everything i did yet afterwards as i came to know more i pitied him instead of hating but at that time i thought his life was without a shadow for i did not know that the lady alice loved him not and now i turned from him and walked slowly up and down the garden paths not exactly thinking but with some ghosts of former thoughts passing through my mind the day too was most lovely as it grew towards evening and i had all the joy of a man lately sick in the flowers and all things if any bells at that time had begun to chime i think i should have laid down on the grass and wept but now there was but the noise of the bees in the yellow musk and that had not music enough to bring me sorrow and as i walked i stooped and picked a great orange lily and held it in my hand and lo down the garden walk the same fair damoiselle that had before this given me good counsel in the hall thereat i was very glad and walked to meet her smiling but she was very grave and said fair sir the lady alice de rose wishes to see you in her chamber i could not answer a word but turned and went with her while she walked slowly beside me 
thinking deeply and picking a rose to pieces as she went and i too thought much what could she want me for surely but for one thing and yet but when we came to the lady's chamber behold before the door stood a tall knight fair and strong and in armour save his head who seemed to be guarding the door though not so as to seem so to all men he kissed the damoiselle eagerly and then she said to me this is sir william de la fosse my true knight and so the knight took my hand and seemed to have such joy of me that all the blood came up to my face for pure delight but then the damoiselle blanche opened the door and bade me go in while she abode still without so i entered when i had put aside the heavy silken hanging that filled the doorway and there sat alice she arose when she saw me and stood pale and with her lips apart and her hands hanging loose by her side and then all doubt and sorrow went quite away from me i did not even feel drunk with joy but rather felt that i could take it all in lose no least fragment of it then at once i felt that i was beautiful and brave and true i had no doubt as to what i should do now i went up to her and first kissed her on the forehead and then on the feet and then drew her to me and with my arms round about her and her arms hanging loose and her lips dropped we held our lips together so long that my eyes failed me and i could not see her till i looked at her green raiment and she had never spoken to me yet she seemed just then as if she were going to for she lifted her eyes to mine and opened her mouth but she only said dear lionel and fell forward as though she were faint and again i held her and kissed her all over and then she loosed her hair that it fell to her feet and when i clipped her next she threw it over me that it fell all over my scarlet robes like trickling of some golden well in paradise then within a while we called in the lady blanche and sir william de la fosse and while they talked about what we should do we sat together and kissed and what they said i know not but i remember that that night quite late alice and i rode out side by side from the good city in the midst of a great band of knights and men-at-arms and other bands drew to us as we went and in three days we reached sir william's castle which was called la garde des chevaliers and straightway he caused toll the great bell and to hang out from the highest tower to a great banner of red and gold cut into so many points that it seemed as if it were tattered for this was the custom of his house when they wanted their vassals together and alice and i stood up in the tower by the great bell as they told it i remember now that i had passed my hand under her hair so that the fingers of it folded over and just lay on her cheek she gazed down on the bell and at every deafening stroke she drew in her breath and opened her eyes to a wide stare downwards but on the very day that we came they arrayed her in gold and flowers and there were angels and knights and ladies wrought on her gold raiment and i waited for an hour in the chapel till she came listening to the swallows outside and gazing with parted lips at the pictures on the golden walls but when she came i knelt down before the altar and she knelt down and kissed my lips and then the priest came in and the singers and the censor boys and that chapel was soon confusedly full of golden raiment and incense and ladies and singing in the midst of which i wedded alice and men came into knight's guard till we had two thousand men in it and great store of munitions of war and provisions but alice and i lived happily together in the painted hall and in the fair water meadows and as yet no one came against us and still her talk was of deeds of arms and she was never tired of letting the serpent rings of my mail slip off her wrist and long hand and she would kiss my shield and helm and the gold wings on my surcoat my mother's work 
and would talk of the ineffable joy that would be when we had fought through all the evil that was coming on us also she would take my sword and lay it on her knees and talk to it telling it how much she loved me yea in all things o lord god thou knowest that my love was a very child like the angels o oh, my wise soft-handed love endless passion endless longing always satisfied think you that the shouting curses of the trumpets broke off our love or in any ways lessened it no most certainly but from the time the siege began her cheeks grew thinner and her passionate face seemed more and more a part of me now too whenever i happened to see her between the grim fighting she would do nothing but kiss me all the time or wring my hands or take my head on her breast being so eagerly passionate that sometimes a pang shot through me that she might die till one day they made a breach in the wall and when i heard of it for the first time i sickened and could not call on god but alice cut me a tress of her yellow hair and tied it to my helm and armed me and saying no word led me down to the breach by the hand and then went back most ghastly pale so there on one side of the breach were the spears of william de la fosse and lionel of the gold wings and on the other the spears of king gilbert and sir guy le bonamont but the king himself was not there sir guy was well what would you have in this world never yet could two thousand men stand against twenty thousand we were almost pushed back with their spear points they were so close together slay six of them and the spears were as thick as ever but if two of our men fell there was straightway a hole yet just at the end of this we drove them back in one charge two yards beyond the breach and behold in the front rank sir guy utterly fearless cool and collected nevertheless with one stroke i broke his helm and he fell to the ground before the two armies even as i fell that day in the lists and we drove them twenty feet farther yet they saved sir guy well again what would you have they drove us back again and they drove us into our inner castle walls and i was the last to go in and just as i was entering the boldest and nearest of the enemy clutched at my love's hair in my helm shouting out quite loud whore's hair for john the goldsmith at the hearing of which blasphemy the lord gave me such strength that i turned and caught him by the ribs with my left hand and with my right by sheer strength i tore off his helm and part of his nose with it and then swinging him round about dashed his brains out against the castle walls yet thereby was i nearly slain for they surrounded me only sir william and the others charged out and rescued me but hardly may the lord help all true men in an hour we were all fighting pell-mell on the walls of the castle itself and some were slain outright and some were wounded and some yielded themselves and received mercy but i had scarce the heart to fight any more because i thought of alice lying with her face upon the floor and her agonised hands outspread trying to clutch something trying to hold to the cracks of the boarding so when i had seen william de la fosse slain by many men i cast my shield and helm over the battlements and gazed about for a second and lo on one of the flanking towers my gold wings still floated by the side of william's white lion and in the other one i knew my poor love whom they had left quite alone was lying so then i turned into a dark passage and ran till i reached the tower stairs up that too i sprang as though a ghost were after me i did so long to kiss her again before i died to soothe her too so that she should not feel this day when in the after-time she thought of it as wholly miserable to her for i knew they would neither slay her nor treat her cruelly for in sooth all loved her only they would make her marry sir guy le bonamont in the topmost room i found her alas alas lying on the floor as i said 
i came to her and kissed her head as she lay then raised her up and i took all my armour off and broke my sword over my knee and then i led her to the window away from the fighting from whence we only saw the quiet country and kissed her lips till she wept and looked no longer sad and wretched then i said to her now o oh love we must part for a little it is time for me to go and die why should you go away she said they will come here quick enough no doubt and i shall have you longer with me if you stay i do not turn sick at the sight of blood oh my poor love and i could not go because of the praying face surely god would grant anything to such a face as that oh she said you will let me have you yet a little longer i see also let me kiss your feet she threw herself down and kissed them and then did not get up again at once but lay there holding my feet and while she lay there behold a sudden tramping that she did not hear and over the green hangings the gleam of helmets that she did not see and then one pushed aside the hangings with his spear and there stood the armed men will not somebody weep for my darling she sprung up from my feet with a low bitter moan most terrible to hear she kissed me once on the lips then stood aside with her dear head thrown back and holding her lovely loose hair strained over her outspread arms as though she were wearied of all things that had been or that might be then one thrust me through the breast with a spear and another with his sword which was three inches broad gave me a stroke across the thighs that hit to the bone and as i fell forward one cleft me to the teeth with his axe and then i heard my darling shriek end of golden wings end of part twelve end of prose romances from the oxford and cambridge magazine by william morris read by phil benson